Hey everyone, this lesson is on botulism. In this lesson, we're going to talk about what botulism is. We're also going to talk about what causes it. We're also going to talk about some of the signs and symptoms and how we can diagnose and how we can treat it. So botulism is a neuroparalytic condition caused by bacterial neurotoxin from spores of Clostridium botulinum. So Clostridium botulinum is a gram-positive bacilli. If we were to put it under a microscope and do a gram stain, it would come out purple. And it's rod-shaped, so it is a bacillus type of bacteria. And the key to Clostridium botulinum is that it is an obligate anaerobe. It requires no oxygen to grow. So if there's any oxygen present, it can become stressed and produce spores. We'll talk about, a bit more about this a little later on. This type of bacteria is widespread. It is actually worldwide, and it can be found everywhere. And there are actually eight strains of Clostridium botulinum, and they are defined as strain A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. And all of these produce a different toxin. So how we actually get botulism occurs via a few different routes. One of them is through ingestion. So ingesting contaminated food that oftentimes was improperly or inadequately stored, so something that was perhaps a canned food, and a lot of times it is homemade canned food that was not properly pressurized and heated to destroy the bacteria or to destroy the spores of the bacteria. And the problem is if you ingest the toxin from this bacteria, you actually don't know it because it doesn't have a particular smell and it doesn't have a particular taste. Now, a second way that you can actually be infected by this condition is through inhalation. This is very rare and it only occurs in laboratory settings. And the third type is through direct inoculation. So this is essentially a puncture wound where spores of the bacteria can enter into the opened wound. Again, this is quite rare as well. And we'll get into more detail what happens specifically when you ingest it or when you have direct inoculation. So what is the pathogenesis? So we talked about the spores of the bacteria that produce the toxin. So what happens is the spores of Clostridium botulinum will form under certain conditions. So we talked about this before. Clostridium botulinum requires no oxygen at all. It needs an environment that has no oxygen. If there is something that causes stress to the bacteria, like even some oxygen, the bacteria will sense it and will produce spores to protect itself, to protect itself for future generations. These spores exist in a variety of areas, including underground soil, river, and seawater. So what happens is the Clostridium botulinum bacteria, when it is under certain conditions, when it is under certain stresses, will produce spores. And spores are metabolically inert and resistant to many environmental stresses. And when those spores enter an environment where it is conducive for the growth of the bacteria, those spores will actually revert back into the Clostridium botulinum bacteria. And the Clostridium botulinum bacteria itself is what produces the neurotoxin and it releases the neurotoxin into the surrounding environment. And this toxin is actually the most potent toxin that has been discovered. So there are certain environments that are conducive to spore formation. So we talked about one of them, that's low oxygen. So the bacteria need to have no oxygen to live and survive. If there's even a little bit of oxygen, the bacteria sense it and form spores. The second environment that promotes spore formation is particular temperatures. Warm temperatures between 25 to 37 degrees Celsius. So generally you can think of it as room temperature. And the third is acidic water, but water that is not too acidic. So anywhere from pH of 4.6 to 7, you can think of it in that range. So some acidity, but not too acidic and warm temperature and low oxygen will all promote the formation of spores. We talked about this before. There are eight strains of this bacteria. All of them produce different types of toxins, but only the strains A, B, E, and F, and perhaps strain G and H cause disease in humans. So C and D, strains C and D don't cause disease in humans. They are known to cause disease in other mammals and other animals, but these Specific strains, A, B, E, and F, are known to cause disease, and perhaps G and H as well. 
So the Clostridium botulinum bacteria itself is what produces the neurotoxin known as botulinum toxin. And this toxin can affect cholinergic presynaptic neurons. So we'll talk about that first. So what normally happens is that in an individual, they have a skeletal muscle that they want to contract. They have a presynaptic cholinergic neuron, which means that it stores acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And you can think of this whole apparatus, the presynaptic neuron and the skeletal muscle as a neuromuscular junction. And what happens is there are acetylcholine receptors on the skeletal muscle and that presynaptic neuron releases acetylcholine into the synapse. The acetylcholine will then bind to the acetylcholine receptors on the skeletal muscle, leading to contraction of that skeletal muscle. That is what normally happens in a healthy individual. So when there is this botulinum toxin present, this toxin can actually bind to the presynaptic neuron. And you can think of it as preventing the release of acetylcholine into the synapse. So there's no acetylcholine, we don't get activation of these acetylcholine receptors on the skeletal muscle, we get no contraction. If we were to zoom up onto a synapse closer, so we can think of this as the presynaptic neuron, and here's a botulinum toxin. This presynaptic neuron contains acetylcholine vesicles, and there is a, something called a snare protein. A snare protein essentially allows the vesicles containing acetylcholine to fuse to the presynaptic neuron membrane and release the acetylcholine. So we need that snare protein. But what happens is the botulinum toxin will bind to the presynaptic neuron, will be taken up into the presynaptic neuron through endocytosis, will be in an endosome in the presynaptic neuron, and then will be released from the endosome and will bind to the snare protein. Botulinum toxin binding to the snare protein will actually cause it to be cleaved and destroyed. So that's the main issue here. The botulinum toxin will bind to snare proteins, causing their destruction. And like I said before, we need snare proteins for vesicles that contain acetylcholine to be released. And this is what causes this issue. We don't have snare proteins, so we are not able to get the acetylcholine out of the presynaptic neuron into the synapse to bind to acetylcholine receptors on skeletal muscle. That's why we lose our ability to contract our skeletal muscles. So now that we know the pathogenesis of botulism, what are some of the clinical features? Botulism infections have a varied symptomatology. So they have anywhere from mild symptoms to severe and life-threatening symptoms. And their incubation periods, depending on how you become infected, varies as well. So incubation periods vary depending on the type of botulism infection. We're going to talk about three types of botulism infections in this lesson. But all three types of botulism infections have characteristic findings. They all have findings that are in common. One is that they all have symmetric descending paralysis. Very key. Symmetric, so it's on both sides of the body, and it starts from the head and goes down toward the toes. Symmetric descending paralysis. The second characteristic finding of botulism infections is that they don't have a fever. There is no fever in botulism infections. The third characteristic finding is that they may have visual deficits. They may have issues with sight, but they don't have any other sensory deficits. So again, a very key finding with botulism is that there are no other sensory deficits. The fourth is that the patient, although they may have symmetric descending paralysis, they are alert and responsive. They know what's going on. So they're not unresponsive and crashing. They are actually alert and responsive. And the fifth is that looking at their vital signs, we see normal blood pressure and maybe a slow to normal heart rate. But again, their vital signs are generally normal. We're going to first talk about infant botulism. Infant botulism is also known as floppy baby syndrome. So floppy baby syndrome, no tone. And again, that's all related to that characteristic finding of a symmetric descending paralysis. This is actually the most common type of botulism. And infant botulism affects infants from the age of one week to 12 months old, but most of the time it affects infants under the age of six months. And most of the time it is infants who are about three to four months of age. All of this is because of the nature of the immature gut flora in an infant. So the infant has not developed 
a mature gut microbiome. They don't have mature gut flora. So what happens is in an infant with an immature gut flora, if they were to eat or consume dust that have Clostridium botulinum spores, those spores can enter into their intestinal system and those spores can then form into the Clostridium botulinum bacteria. And those bacteria, because it's an immature gut flora, there's not enough gut bacteria or proportions of gut bacterial species, they can flourish. And these Clostridium botulinum can multiply and layer the intestinal mucosa and they can form sizable populations in the guts of infants. And this is what is the problem because then these Clostridium botulinum bacteria can then produce toxins and those toxins can cause infant botulism. The toxins responsible for infant botulism are toxins A, B, E, and F. And infant botulism is classically associated with eating honey, especially eating honey before the age of one year old. So there is some evidence to support this, but it doesn't seem to be very strong evidence as even education and avoidance of eating honey before the age of one doesn't seem to have decreased the levels of infant botulism as much as some researchers had hoped. So what are some of the symptoms of infant botulism? We talked about some of those characteristic findings in the last slide, but there are certain symptoms with regards to infant botulism. One of them is constipation. So if a baby has been having normal bowel movements and all of a sudden has constipation, this can be a symptom. Anorexia and poor feeding can also be a symptom of infant botulism. And then we can start to see some of that loss of tone. So loss of head control or tone can be the first or one of the initial symptoms of infant botulism. You can also see drooling. And the baby can also have a weak cry as well. So some of these are symptoms of infant botulism. The next one we're going to talk about is foodborne botulism. Foodborne botulism is, as its name suggests, from consuming food that contains the toxin. So what happens here is that after the ingestion of the toxin from the food, incubation period for this condition is anywhere from 10 to 36 hours. So it doesn't take a whole lot of time before we start to see some symptoms. Interestingly, the incubation period can be prolonged and may take up to two weeks. Foodborne botulism seems to be mostly caused by toxins A, B, and E. And again, as its name suggests, it's due to consumption of contaminated food. So prodromal symptoms with regards to foodborne botulism include some gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or constipation. You can also see dry mouth and sore throat with this condition. And then once we actually get the symptoms of the foodborne botulism, these include vertigo. So basically an individual feels very dizzy and their whole environment is spinning around them. They can also have dry eyes and blurring vision. So this is some of the initial effects of the botulinum toxin on cranial nerves. And we can also see ptosis, which is drooping of the eyelids with dilated fixed pupils. Again, this is symmetric. So if we see here, this boy has symmetric or bilateral ptosis. And then when we actually look closer, his pupils are dilated and fixed. We can also see dysphagia, so difficulty swallowing. And then the paralysis can begin to descend, causing flaccid paralysis. And if the paralysis descends and reaches the respiratory muscles or the diaphragm, this can be fatal. And in fact, due to misdiagnosing most of the time, this condition can be fatal approximately 5 to 10% of the time. The third type is wound botulism. Wound botulism is similar to the other types of botulism, except it has a prolonged incubation period. It's usually around 10 days. And what happens here is that spores enter into an open wound. So you can think of a puncture wound, and there are spores in the soil, and the spores can get into the wound. Again, this is rare. And wound botulism is similar to foodborne botulism, except there are no prodromal gastrointestinal symptoms. We talked about nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation with regards to the foodborne botulism, but that doesn't happen here. And that makes sense because those Clostridium botulinum spores are not making it into the gastrointestinal tract, so we shouldn't have GI symptoms. With wound botulism, it is unique in that it may have a fever and leukocytosis or increased white blood cell count. You may remember that I said botulism doesn't have a fever. It's actually a characteristic finding that botulism has no fever. 
but with wound botulism, it may have a fever and it's more likely due to a secondary infection. Not so much the spores of the Clostridium botulinum, but likely a secondary infection from another type of bacteria entering the wound, causing a fever and an increased white count. So again, botulism doesn't cause fever, but you may see a secondary fever in wound botulism. Everything else seems to be very similar to the foodborne botulism. Similar symptoms, again, vertigo, dry eyes, blurry vision, and then eventually it can lead to death if that descending paralysis reaches the respiratory muscles. So how do we diagnose and how do we treat botulism? So diagnosis of botulism is through trying to detect the toxin, trying to detect the botulinum toxin. And you can do this through a variety of ways. You can look at their serum, so you can take their blood and check their blood. You can look at their gastric content, so what is in their stomach, check to see if there's a toxin there. Or you can check their stool. Are they essentially excreting out botulinum toxin in their stool? These can all help in making the diagnosis. Trying to culture this bacteria is very difficult. It is an obligate anaerobe and makes it very difficult to culture in a lab. So it's difficult to try to culture and make the diagnosis through culturing of the bacteria. How do we treat it? So treatment can involve several different things. So gastric lavage is one way. So you essentially pour down fluid into their stomach and then suck it back up. This can be performed within hours of ingesting a food that contains the botulinum toxin. But the problem with this is that you need to know that the food actually has the toxin. So how do you know that? So this is often only going to be used if we absolutely know that the food contains the toxin. Or you can give the Clostridium botulinum toxoid. So the toxoid can be given usually in adults and the toxoid can bind to botulinum toxin to prevent the toxin from causing all those issues we talked about before. But a lot of times it's, it's a supportive treatment, so we have to just support the patient throughout. And a lot of times it's ensuring that they can breathe and assisting in their breathing if they can. Now I wanna quickly talk about Botox. Many of us have probably heard about Botox. Botox is actually botulinum toxin A. So what scientists do is that they essentially cultivate clostridium botulinum and spores to produce this type of toxin, botulinum toxin A. And it can be used for a variety of reasons. It can be used for cosmetic use. We've probably seen advertisements and we've probably seen actresses and actors getting Botox to help with their skin wrinkles. But Botox can be used to treat other conditions like achalasia. How do we prevent botulism from occurring in the first place? Clostridium botulinum toxin can be inactivated with high temperatures. What kind of high temperatures do we need? We want to have at least 120 degrees Celsius for at least five to 10 minutes to inactivate the botulinum toxin. So it's important to cook food properly, especially anything that's been canned or especially any homemade canned foods. It's also important to avoid feeding honey or corn syrup to children under the age of one year old. So talked about this before, there's some evidence to support that you may get infant botulism from eating honey, especially under the age of one. So it's best to avoid feeding children under the age of one any honey or corn syrup. You also wanna be very careful preparing or eating any homemade canned foods like we talked about before. And you wanna avoid eating contents of a canned food if the can is bulging. What do I mean by bulging? Essentially the can is bulging out like this. And that means that there's air in the can and that air content suggests the presence of Clostridium botulinum. So Clostridium botulinum can metabolize certain sugars that are in the can and it can produce gas like carbon dioxide. So a bulging can can suggest the presence of Clostridium botulinum. So if you wanna learn more about other infectious diseases, please check out my infectious disease playlist. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider supporting the channel by subscribing. And as always, continue to live, laugh, and learn, and I hope to see you next time.